curator, Johnny Hamburger. Welcome to Geek Therapy Radio this week, and boy, I really got to tell you, Nike is pissing me off. Nike, Nike-ly. Nike has really, really offended me to the point where I don't even know how much I can really say about it because I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to create too much of a heated argument here that gets me saying something stupid. This entire ordeal just rubs me the wrong way, pisses me off, and makes me not want to buy any Nike product. It really pisses me off that they haven't released the Hyper Adapt 1.0. I'm so pissed I can't buy self-lacing shoes. What's up with that, Nike? How can you piss us off so much that you tease us with these self-lacing shoes and then you don't make them available to the general public? The audacity of Nike. Can you believe them? This is really pissing people off. <laughs> no, but seriously, I, Nike uh, teased, not teased, they, they released in limited numbers because basically it's a, it's a concept more than an actual widespread release of a, of a product. The Hyper Adapts, and a lot of you might have even forgotten what those are. I know there's a lot of sneakers, out, sneaker lovers out there who know exactly what they are. But remember in Back to the Future 2, where we saw the Nike Air Mags. They were self-lacing shoes. Marty slipped his feet into there, and they, and they yanked down on his foot, and they were self-lacing shoes. And it was the coolest thing. One of the coolest things, beside the hoverboard and the DeLorean, I think that's probably the third coolest thing about Back to the Future 2. And they did actually release working Air Mags, and Michael J. Fox actually put them on. Which is really cool in itself. But, I really want uh, the adapt uh, Hyper Adapts to come to more widespread a more widespread market. I want to go to the I want to go to Foot Locker and just buy Hyper Adapts. That'd be awesome. And that's a that's a big thing coming for me because for the past geez, 20 years at least the only shoes I've ever worn have been Vans. Period. End of story. Vans and rarely dress shoes. Do you remember back in the day when you were in elementary school and you, every once in a while, your parents would take you to get new shoes and you couldn't wait to get to school the next day because you'd feel like the coolest kid on the playground and you also believed all the hype and advertising of the shoe that it would make you faster or jump higher. So the next day in the playground, you tried to show everybody you could run faster than them only to realize that you cannot run that fast and that little flames don't shoot off the back of your feet. But shoes were shoes were a much bigger deal to me to me back then. I remember getting the light up shoes, the shoes that I want adult shoes that light up. St- like straight up no joke, I want adult shoes and I would wear them if they lit up. I would wear dress shoes that lit up. I promise you, I would go to a funeral wearing <laughs> light up RGB shoes. I'm sure they exist. They probably do exist. How come I haven't bought some light up shoes yet? Do you remember pumps? Uh, I think Reebok Reebok was the first one to release the pumps. And if you were, did they ever release like pump? If you if you were to walk uh, into your school the next day buying shoes and and your shoes somehow had the pumps on them and light up, that was it. You were king or queen of the castle. There's nothing. Nobody could touch you. You were instantly like the coolest kid on earth for until you graduated high school. Remember Billy showed up in second grade with pumps and light up shoes? That kid was the coolest kid that ever lived. Probably still probably still the coolest person that ever lived. So, yeah, I wish uh, 
Nike re release. Let me buy some Hyper Adapts. Self-lacing shoes is the coolest thing in the world, and, and Nike, you, the fact that you're holding out on us really pisses me off. Me and a lot of people. I think it pisses us off so much that some people are even lighting their shoes on fire, which I know you don't care about because they already bought the shoes. But still, you've got people really riled up over this. Unless I'm missing something. I don't know. I just remember shoes back in the day being a lot cooler to me than they are now, and I know a lot of people geek out about sneakers, geek out about shoes. I have a couple of friends who are massively into shoes. Not shoes, sneakers. I should, I should rephrase that, sneakers. I think uh, back a few years ago, I actually bought some Chucks, some Chuck Taylors, because for some reason I was thinking punk rock and Kurt Cobain and everything and I wanted wanted some Chucks. I said, I, I don't think I, I don't recall ever wearing Chucks. You know what I realized? Chuck Taylors are super uncomfortable. It's just canvas and rubber. They are horrible. <laughs> it, is, it is a big time fashion statement if you're walking around rocking Chucks. And the thing that blew my mind even more is I had uh, the high top, high top Chucks and Chuck Taylors used to be basketball shoes. That's what the first basketball players wore, were those canvas and rubber Chuck Taylors. I couldn't imagine more hell on your ankle than running around playing an entire basketball game in Chuck Taylors. Uh, more Geek Day Free Radio coming up. I'm Johnny Hemberger, your mental curator. Stick with me. We're going to talk about some real cool stuff here. It is going to be an awesome show. Stick around. Welcome back to Geek Therapy Radio. I am Johnny Hamburger, your mental curator. Coming up in the next segment, I talk to Dr. Tim Cooper. He is a biologist, uh, to say the least. And we talk about what would actually go into and what are some of the challenges of resurrecting extinct animals, specifically dinosaurs. So that's a very interesting t uh, discussion with an actual an actual doctor about it, an actual biologist. So that's going to be really neat. That's coming up in the next segment. Me and Dr. Tim Cooper talking about resurrecting extinct animals. But welcome back to Geek Therapy Radio. In this segment, I want to talk about electric cars and transportation and the future. And this 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 discussion this segment is going to go you know a, a few different ways but i guess i will just start it off by saying we one of the biggest challenges to uh electric cars and the rollout of electric cars on a on a widespread in a more widespread fashion isn't just the technological difficulties the uh range anxiety well the the batteries and the, all the electronic components and all the engineering that goes involved, that's almost the easy part. What I'm getting at is the hard part still seems to be educating the general public. I think a lot of people really like the idea of electric cars. They really like the idea of not using, not having to pay for any more gasoline. You're going to pay for the energy either way. But not paying for the gasoline. Uh, a lot of us are concerned with a vehicle's effect on the environment. So there's a whole lot of pros towards, in people's minds, towards going electric. But one of the biggest things, the biggest hurdle still, like I said, besides the technological challenges, which are easy compared to, we still need to educate the general public about just about electric cars, period. You know, I was reading that... Um, well, who was the columnist? It was an expert in the field, and he said, to, to, put it, to put it simply, he still receives lots of questions from quite a few people about something as simple as, quote-unquote, what do I do when my car battery dies? How do I fill it back up? And you and you think I'm being facetious here. You think I'm I'm overstating it, but I'm not. That's a legit question that 
a lot of people in the general public have, how do I fill my electric car back up once it, once the battery depletes? And it's not because those people are stupid. It's just not, they're just, I guess they're just not thinking it through. You fill it up the same way you charge your cell phone. You just plug it in. You drive, you put it, you don't go to a gas station. You go into your, your park and you, to your garage or your driveway and you just plug a cord into it. Just like you're plugging in a toaster or something. Or more accurately, again, it's just plugging in a phone. Just picture it as a big 3,000 pound, 4,000 pound, 5,000 pound phone. That's what you do when you run out of quote unquote fuel in your electric car. Just plug it in. But you would be surprised how many people haven't thought that far or it didn't dawn on them. And I don't blame those people that they're ignorant about it. They've gone their entire life getting used to and utilizing gasoline powered vehicles. It's it's like muscle memory when you're when you see your your needle go low, you're running low on fuel, you plug it into you plug the the pump into it, the nozzle into your car and you squirt gas in there. But you would be surprised how many people are ignorant about what gasoline is and where gasoline comes from. All they know is they plug a nozzle thing into the car and it makes funny smells and now their car, the needle goes up. That's as far as they have to think about it. That's part of the beauty of of why of why gasoline vehicles work so well. There, there's no education involved in it. It's just what people know. It's what they're raised on. It's what they're used to. But people aren't used to electric cars. And it's strange to them. It sounds futuristic or like it's something that only millennials will know how to do or only young people will know how to do. But it's really as simple as just plugging something in, plugging in your cell phone, plugging in, I was about to say your VCR, plugging in your TV, plugging in whatever, recharging whatever. It's just now you recharge your car. That's it. But the point remains, there's a lack of education awareness about electric cars that they're not these strange things that require so much extra attention and difficulty and learning curve you drive it like you drive your gasoline car it's just you plug in it at home overnight and then it's ready full tank when you leave again there's still some range anxiety but range anxiety is getting better um the chevy bolt for instance this is not an ad for chevy but the chevy bolt has come to market before the tesla model 3 at the price point that the Model 3 was supposed to come out at. So you can buy a Chevy Bolt for well under 40000 especially with a tax credit. And you have up to and over, a lot of owners are stating, over 238 miles per per charge, per full, full, full charge. So 238, that means I can go to Austin, plug it in in Austin, you know, wherever I'm at. And it's I come out the next day, it's full again, and I drive back home to Houston. So the range anxiety is being eliminated. Chevy has, Tesla better watch out because Chevy has beat Tesla to the market with an affordable electric car. And I think the Bolt also, and again, this is not an ad for Chevy, the Bolt also just looks like a normal car. When the Prius came out, it looked out of this world and it still looks ridiculous. It looks better, but it still looks ridiculous. The Chevy Bolt, unless someone pointed it out to you that it was an electric car, you might not take a second glance at it. It just looks like a hatchback. The Volkswagen E-Golf, which doesn't have um, as much range currently as the Bolt. And by the way, the E-Golf is going away because in 2020, Volkswagen is releasing a whole new line of pure electric vehicles, which I'm waiting for. That's My next car is probably going to be an electric vehicle. I wouldn't be surprised if my next car is a fully 100% electric vehicle, no gas at all. And I'm kind of waiting on Volkswagen to release them in 2020. They look cool. Look them up. Um, so that brings me to this, this next point is that and it kind of goes more towards autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, the Tesla and other other uh, I guess, well, other models, I guess. Autonomous electric vehicles. People are very ignorant, borderline stupid when it comes to what autonomous vehicles are. And Tesla doesn't do themselves any favors. I've said this before. Tesla doesn't do themselves any favors. Elon Musk doesn't do himself any favors by calling the assisted driving mode autopilot. Because people 
who are ignorant, I won't just say stupid, who are just at least ignorant, put in an autopilot mode and they're looking at their phones and things and something comes out front that auto, they auto, quote unquote autopilot doesn't catch in time and they hit something and crash. A woman in Utah recently sued Tesla because her Model S crashed and she broke her foot. As it turns out, she put into this quote unquote autopilot mode was looking down on her phone and didn't see whatever pulled out in front of her and the car didn't stop in time and she crashed into it. And the cops rode her up and fined her for in, for uh, failure to operate safely operate a vehicle. Failure to stop in time, failure to whatever. And now she's suing Tesla. Tesla, it's your fault my car didn't stop in time. I was in your autopilot mode. No, lady, that's not what it means. It's just driver assist. It doesn't mean stop paying attention, stop operating the vehicle. And when you turn on the driver assist mode, when you turn on autopilot mode, it warns you from from heaven to hell and earth in between to keep your focus on the road, keep your hands near the wheel, keep your feet near the pedals because it's just driver assist. Don't be an idiot and stop paying attention to the road. It is just driver assist. So. That all goes towards my whole argument this this segment. There needs to be, we've reached the point where we've pretty much got produ- producing electric cars down. There's still room for improvement, but the big, hardest issue to overcome here is educating the public on what electric cars are and what autonomous vehicles are, or semi-autonomous vehicles are. Education is still very necessary in this quest towards fully electric cars. I'm Johnny Hamburger, stick around. Tim Cooper coming up. We're going to talk about resurrecting extinct animals. It's going to be fun. More Geek Therapy Radio in just a moment. Welcome back to Geek Therapy Radio. I am your mental curator, Johnny Hamburger, and I am very excited. I've had uh, a few people on the show, and th- today I'm actually kind of really geeking out. You know, I was it's it's like I'm like a kid in a candy shop because I'm actually getting to talk to a real biologist on something that I find fascinating, and I'm sure he finds fascinating too. Uh, I will introduce him real quick as Tim, but I will let Tim introduce himself fully because I don't want to butcher his title or his name. Um, and he's we're, we're connected all the way from New Zealand here, so this is by far the longest phone call I think we've had on the show so far. So, Tim, welcome in, and uh, tell everyone who you are. Great. Thanks, Johnny. Yeah, my name's uh, Tim Cooper. I'm a professor of molecular bion sciences at Massey University in Auckland, New Zealand. That's that's wonderful. See, I got your name from the directory uh, at U of H. So can you tell what 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 were you doing over at U of H? When when did you uh, when did you leave? Uh, yeah, I was there for ten years. I've had ten years in Texas, uh, and I left there in January this year. Wow. Okay. So as I kind of told you before what i was this is kind of a a mental exercise if if nothing else um i'm sure well what sparked it off is i read in the news the story they found i don't know if you've you've seen it too i'm I'm sure you have they unearthed a a foal a a horse there in siberia that they date between 40 and thousand years old have you read anything about that uh, a horse? No, I haven't read a horse. Uh, I've seen plenty of mammoths being unearthed there. But. Yes, yeah, and that that's what got my mind rolling, because usually it's mammoths, and any time they unearth one of these uh, extinct, extinct creatures, the conversation always comes up about cloning. Can we clone this this extinct species of horse? Can we clone uh, the woolly mammoth and such? Uh, I don't know about you, but back when Jurassic Park came out, I think that's what, it, I don't mean to sound too daft here, but back when Jurassic Park came out, I think that sparked a lot of kind of young minds thinking about Thinking about cloning, not necessarily believing that, uh, you know, at least right now we could resurrect an extinct species. But that's why I kind of want to talk to you, because I want to talk about the what potential roadblocks and the complications that could 
could arise from from trying to do just that. Not specifically a dinosaur, but I guess I'll just ask you: Have you uh, seen Jurassic Park? Have, did you enjoy that movie at all? <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I have uh, way back then. Uh, yeah, and uh, it's it's true that I remember the scenes uh, looking at the cloning that. Uh, probably played some influence in, in the direction that that my research, you know, early research career took. Yes. See, you know what's interesting is uh, not not to get too far off topic, but I was talking to somebody recently who they were telling me who was it? I think they emailed the show or something that they are an aeronautical engineer now. They went to uh, they went into the Air Force here in the states, and they and it's, they got set down a path of of uh of airplanes and air, air, air i can't even talk it's hard to say aeronautical engineering but what sparked them down this path wasn't necessarily some you know really amazing ted talk that they saw what initially sparked them down the path was playing a video game where they were playing as fighter pilots and that's what sparked them to get into into that field so it doesn't seem far fetched. I, I wouldn't say that Jurassic Park probably is the only thing that got you set down that path, but it, it probably it was a good encourager. Would you Would you disagree? Yeah, no, something like that. I, I started off as a as a physics major actually, and uh, I'm not quite sure how it happened, but somehow I ended up in, in molecular biology, and uh, it wasn't everything. <laughs> making biology sound fun, making cloning sound fun was it didn't hurt. Maybe. So, yeah. So, you, did you get a, a degree in physics and then and then move on from there to graduate school and such? No, I started off uh, as a physics major, and then I think I went to a biochemistry major, and uh, ended up with a molecular biology major. I'm, I'm lucky, and uh, I've more or less stuck with that throughout. That's. I'm very. I don't know if jealous is the right word. I, I envy your mind and your dedication to devote to such to such a path but let's get on to the topic at hand here i the way people get duped by the movies sometimes they see something on screen for instance remember the the scene in the original jurassic park where the triceratops is is sick and the botanist is there and she's checking on the triceratops um people actually wrote into the studio they actually wrote to steven uh steven spielberg and all of them uh they were it was animal activists saying how dare you injure a triceratops for the sake of <laughs> for the sake of making a movie so it's not so far-fetched that that people might people might see um this movie and think oh cloning dinosaurs and bringing dinosaurs back to life that must be right around the corner that must be they must be actually working on it that must that must uh, seem feasible to actually do and we, you and i both know that it's not what do you think because they mentioned in jurassic park and i and i that's kind of the most basic way to allude to things for for my audience of who, who is probably mostly lay people on this subject they talked in jurassic park about the the gaps in the dna sequence and how they patched it in with um uh, asexual frogs or frogs that can change their their sex the point is that there was gaps in the gene sequence and they just took other animals and kind of filled in the gaps. Can you, is it, is it within your realm to tell us yes or no? Is that possible? And if not, why not? Yeah. Um, it's interesting. I think actually they, they were probably closer to being realistic than, uh, than, than people have got for a while after that. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I mean, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I think most people, when they think about resurrecting some extinct species, think about taking the entire, entire genome of that, that, that extinct species, mm -hmm. the, the, the DNA sequence, the, the recipe book for what makes it what it is, mm -hmm. and, and somehow transferring it into, into a cell of a, of a living species and and then getting this kind of hybrid that then then over time begins to look more like extinct species. Hmm. So that this is the process of cloning that uh, that that famously Dolly the sheep um, was produced using. Uh, so that's now twenty something years ago. Yeah. Um, the the problem with that approach is that you really need a very good copy of the the extinct species genome um, because it needs to be complete and needs to work as is. Yeah. Uh, and that that's not 
possible if something has been dead for more than not very many years. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it's possible for frozen preserved mammoths where some of the cells are still intact. Uh, but for dinosaurs, when we're going back millions of years, uh, their DNA is degraded and you can't get a complete copy. Um, so you, you can't revive it as is. Um, yeah. So uh, what, what may be possible um, uh, is, is an approach where you, you make a hybrid. Uh, you, you take some existing species that's related to an extinct species and you start moving parts from the extinct species into that existing species hoping to get something that looks more like the extinct species. Um, so I think uh, this is possible um, if the two species are relatively closely related. Um, and so I, I don't know what the, the hard limits on that might be, yeah. but uh, I, I really doubt there's anything close enough to a dinosaur now so that um, cloning in a few pieces of dinosaur DNA into uh, into a frog or something yeah. um, is going to result in a hybrid that looks like a dinosaur. I'm going to go ahead and leave the conversation there for now until we get back into it in the next segment. Uh, I'm doing this as a an editing for time thing. It was kind of a long interview, so I'm saving it for the next segment. It gets even more interesting, if you can believe it. So stick around to the next interview. In the meantime, Make sure you are all subscribed to the Geek Therapy Radio stuff, to Geek Therapy Radio on face on Facebook, Geek Therapy Radio on Instagram, Geek Therapy Radio on Twitter. Maybe you're watching this on YouTube, but if you're just listening to the radio right now, you can subscribe to Geek Therapy Radio on YouTube, and you can see what I'm doing here on the radio uh, as of this particular segment that you're looking at right now or listening to right now. I'm in my apartment, so I'm not at the radio station here, but this inter my interview with Tim Cooper is at the radio station, so if you're curious to see what's going on on Geek Therapy Radio, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel. I do other videos there. It's not just radio show stuff on there. I actually, uh, I have a review of the NVIDIA Shield tablet that I did a few years ago, how the NVIDIA Shield tablet holds up in 2018 when it came out in 2014. Is it still viable? So I did a, also... A review and an in-depth tour of my 1983 DeLorean, so make sure you are subscribed to Geek Therapy Radio on YouTube and you can see all that good stuff. So I'm coming right back here after this commercial break. If you're listening to the podcast, there's no commercials here. We're just going to get back into it. But after the commercial break, if you're listening to this on the radio, more with Dr. Tim Cooper on the possibilities of resurrecting extinct animals. It's going to be great. Stick around. I'm Johnny Hamburger. More Geek Therapy Radio coming up in just a second. You're just joining us, Dr. Tim Cooper is joined, uh, talking to us about <laughs> resurrecting extinct species and the, and the potential complications and the actual complications that would be involved there. And let's just say we're going to resurrect a T-Rex. Let's just be really specific here. Is there anything remotely close today? And I know in Jurassic Park, they kept talking about birds and everything. Is there anything remotely close today that, that if you were in charge of putting this T-Rex together, this hybrid together, is there something alive today that might make a, you know, as good a candidate as any for a surrogate to take, take the egg and the, in the whatever genetic material and, and, and incubate this thing, take the fetus and bring it to term. Is there anything alive today that could possibly even just wildly speculatively birth a dinosaur hybrid uh yeah yeah uh well i mean it is speculation but uh, yeah. i would i would really strongly suspect no um t-rex went extinct about i don't know 60 million years ago mm -hmm. um so nothing alive today is going to be genetically i would guess genetically close enough to be a good match mm -hmm. um certainly um and not only would it have to be a good match, it would have to be genetically um, so that we could mix and match DNA between extinct and living and get something viable. Uh, but something living today would have to be uh, a good enough match so also it could be physiologically a surrogate. Yeah. Uh, so presumably that means being big enough to carry a, a T-Rex, uh, a developing T-Rex to, to some kind of viable uh, state where it can be uh, fend for itself. So. 
Exactly. And, and I don't know, but I guess maybe that requires quite a quite a you know a big space uh, yeah. and a big host organism that are. You, the, 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 maybe the closest relatives today, little lizards, just aren't going to cut it. Whether we we are able to produce a living dinosaur either with a surrogate host or in the lab, the question remains, and I'm not even going to get into the ethics of it all, but evolutionarily speaking, the Earth has changed so much from the time that the T-Rex in this case has gone extinct that just let's say you were able to bring a perfect living T-Rex into this world what challenges do you think it would face in surviving in this world not just giving it food but is there any sort of environmental factors or ecological or anything like that that might prove that might not be able to sustain a T-Rex what are your thoughts on that uh, yeah, I think that's that's definitely another another uh, issue. <laughs> you know, if we manage to do this, then what? Um, I, I I doubt that just the environment, uh, the the kind of external um, non living environment, has changed enough to be an issue. Mm-hmm. Um, but certainly the ecology, the, the 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 plants that are around now, the animals that are around now, um, have changed so wildly from what was present. Back in the days of the dinosaurs, that um, what they would do if they were released in the wild, I think um, one, it wouldn't be good <laughs> yeah. to the extent they did something, and and two, um, I think it's quite likely it wouldn't be sustainable uh, yeah, either for the T Rex or, or for whatever it was that they were eating. Somebody was was talking to me about this the other day, in that they didn't think this is they were not a scientist. This was just some random person that they didn't think. Um, a dinosaur could exist, let's say. I don't think he was think, remembering that there were small dinosaurs as well, but he's talking about like Brachiosaurus or some huge uh, dinosaur like that, that it wouldn't be able to get enough oxygen today. Like there, there, It was more oxygen-rich, perhaps, back then. Do you think there's any truth to that? Uh, I don't think so. I, I mean, uh, I, I, it's not my feel, but I, I don't think oxygen levels have changed dramatically uh, in this kind of time scale. So um, I think that's, and again, this is just a mental exercise. I think that's what he was getting at is maybe he heard somewhere that the, the, the atmosphere was super rich in oxygen back then and, and the lungs are so big and you need all the uh, all the more oxygen to go into the blood to sustain the, sustain the animal that if you were to able to bring a, a massive animal like a t-rex back to life but here this is what i postulated this is what i countered with i was uh blue whale isn't isn't the blue whale the big i think the blue whale is the biggest organism that has ever not that has ever existed on earth um definitely the biggest mammal but i think just accounting for every animal ever dinosaur or, or anything that the blue whale is the biggest uh animal to ever exist and it breathes it breathes fine it get when it breathes it, it draws in enough oxygen so why not if we were able to reproduce a brachiosaurus would it not be able to breathe um yeah 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 i i think you're right i think i think the blue whale is the biggest organism ever um mm-hmm. at least you know multicellular organism um yeah, I, I think that's true. I mean, I, I guess I would say if oxygen levels back then were different, then um, then then the brachiosaurus wouldn't be have been given a chance to adapt to any any change, whereas the blue whale has presumably been able to adapt as as levels change. Mm-hmm. Um, all, although I, I really don't think the external environment is different enough that that would be the problem. Um, you know, we we know temperatures increase, we know carbon dioxide has come up. Yeah, but um, I think these things are probably pretty minor for for the average dinosaur. Yeah, I think we both agree there. Uh, coming up to the end here, what it usually usually when I'm talking to guests and such, I ask them, you know, what they want to plug or anything like that. But but Tim, what are you what are you working on currently? What's got you excited? What have you, what are since this is Geek Therapy Radio, what are you quote unquote geeking out about right now? Uh, well, um, the kind of research we do, or at least what, what I'm interested in, in getting more into, is um, effects of uh, antibiotic resistance on bacteria. 
Mm -hmm. And especially what happens to bacteria once they become resistant. Do they learn to adapt to that resistance? Uh, or do they they suffer in the in the absence of that drug now and and we've made this kind of um, hobbled bacteria that that will revert to being susceptible when we withdraw the drug, um, which which sounds very different from cloning in dinosaurs, but actually um, uh, what it involves is how different mutations interact with one another and affect yes. one another and do or don't add up in some predictable way, which I think is is one of the problems with trying to make a hybrid between a dinosaur and a, and a living species is we don't know how those two different sets of DNA are going to add up together. But whether we take half of something that's viable and half of another thing that's viable and put them together, do we get something viable? or Do we get something that uh, there's some conflict, some antagonism, and, and things don't work out? Yeah. Um, so at lots of different levels... Um, Dinosaurs and, and birds to, to bacteria and antibiotic resistance. I think that this this theme of uh, genetic interactions is important. Yes, it, so that's what I'm geeking out about. Yeah, and and there because there's there's massive again understatement to say that there's massive parallels there. What who's not to say that the research you're doing isn't isn't pivotal in this quest towards, I don't know if we call it a quest, but but cloning anything, not just cloning dinosaurs or clon uh, cloning woolly mammoths, but but people or different, more complex types of species. What you're doing to me and to a lot of people listening definitely plays a role in that. You, you can't just toss different different DNA together and different, you know, the, the genetic makeup of different animals together and expect it just to work. So the research you're doing is, is kind of, is paving the, is paving the way for learning more about that process. Yeah, I, I hope so. I mean, I hope it's, it's at least part of a conversation that uh, we need to understand uh, if there are any general rules about how different sources of DNA uh, uh, go together, how yeah. they work together. Dr. Tim Cooper, thank you so much for coming on Geek Therapy Radio. It was an absolute pleasure, and I wish you all the success in the world, in the universe, and hopefully I'll get to have you back on again one day. Great. Well, thank you very much, Johnny. That's going to do it for Geek Therapy Radio this week. Again, my eternal thanks to Dr. Tim Cooper for coming on here and having that fascinating discussion on resurrecting extinct animals. Uh, in the meantime, until next week... Subscribe to Geek Therapy Radio, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, all that good stuff. And be good to each other, starting by being good to yourself. It's much easier to be good to each other when we start by being good to ourselves. So indulge a new hobby, find a new ho hobby, rekindle an old hobby, and just be good to yourself. Until next week, I'm Johnny Hamburger, your mental curator. See you then.